It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. I'm excited to talk with my guest today. Joining me is Peter Gracie, CEO of Quota Factory. And Quota Factory provides a PRM, so PRM system. I'll make sure I say that closely or say it carefully, which is another acronym for people to, to keep in mind. This is a personal relationship management platform, and it's based on their 14 years in the sales development space, which you know we all know space with a lot of interesting things going on, but 14 years is is probably about uh, four times longer than anybody else has been in the space. So we're going to talk about that and much more. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andy. Glad to be here. Yeah, so take a minute, introduce yourself. I mean, how'd you, how'd you get your start in sales? Sure. I, uh, I'm Pete Gracie, as you said, CEO of Quota Factory. And I got my start in sales very unceremoniously, um, trying to book weddings for a hotel chain. <laughs> I, did, I did very oh, I love that. Yeah, I, I got some terrible stories uh, from that. But I did get... Oh, do you have one good story you can share? Yeah, I, I've told it a couple times, but I was there was one point in time where I was... You know, I had my little polyester suit and I was manager on duty for the weekend. So a manager needs to cycle in and basically run the hotel every weekend. And they you rotate the different managers of the different departments. So I was a sales guy, but it was my manager on duty weekend. And a young couple came in who wanted to get married at the hotel. I was living in Costa Mesa, California at the time. Mm -hmm. And I gave them the tour. I was, you know, classic new sales guy. I wasn't listening to anything they were saying. I was just talking to them or at them. Um, and in order to get to the rest, to the function facility, you had to go through the pool. So as I'm, I'm blabbing away, um, talking about the hotel and how magnificent it is, I walked right into the hot tub <laughs> and went head first, got totally soaked. My, you know, I looked like a wet rat coming out of the, the hot tub. The, the woman was very nice. She was helping me out. The, the fiance, the gentleman was a little less kind and was laughing at me hysterically. So that to, the, to date, I mean, I've had some really bad sales stories just to be candid, but that's, yeah. that's the worst one. Well, if that's the worst, that's not horrible. No, it's a good story anyways. Yeah, at least no one was shooting at you or anything like that. That's true. That's true. But did you, did you close the order? Oh, God, no. No, they were, uh, yeah, they probably they out of there. set foot in that hotel again. Yeah. <laughs> so you made your way from Southern California to, to Boston. Yes, I, I grew up in in Massachusetts. Um, I lived in well, I actually lived in Newport Beach for a while, and then I I was transferred down to your neck of the woods in San Diego. And for whatever reason, I took a transfer back to Massachusetts. And every January and February morning, I wake up wondering why. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I've been here ever since. And and I got into software sales when I came back at a company called Web Hire, which was applicant tracking, resume management, mm -hmm. and, and that's where I really got excited about technology sales and and I was hired as a BDR to learn the the lead generation um, ex expertise at web hire had a great boss who became a real you know, lifetime mentor named Ellen Madonia um, at that at that organization I eventually took over the biz dev team and I met my business partner uh, Paul Alves who was running the sales team so we had a great model and you know 2002 we we got to thinking you know what our focus on on opportunity quality uh, is really could really fill a hole in this outsourced lead gen space. We should spin this out. So we started a company in September of 2002 called AG Salesworks. Mm -hmm. And fast forward, I'm going to date myself here, but you already mentioned it. 14 years. Um, you don't have to worry about dating yourself. I do, but you don't. That's true. My yeah. LinkedIn photo does it for me anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, no, you look I, you look pretty young in your LinkedIn photo. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's probably the one from seven years ago. I should, uh, I should update that one, right? I appreciate that. Um, so it, we fast forward 14 years. We've done over 450 unique engagements. And you know, we, we were talking, you and I were talking pre-show. Um, we saw an alarming trend about two years ago in our marketplace where the competitive landscape just ballooned. A lot of out-of-work sales and marketing professionals were starting lead generation firms. And we saw an immediate change to our top sales objection from, hey, I've got a team. You guys sound great, but I don't need the help now. Call me in six months and maybe we'll do some business together, which is fine. Mm -hmm. 
it changed from that to I've been burned by a firm like yours before. Never call me again. Right. Um, so as an entrepreneur and a business owner, um, my business partner and I obviously had some anxiety <laughs> around that. And we channeled that positively and we, that's where Quota Factory was born. So what we've essentially done is taken our outsourced business. We've rolled that up under the Quota Factory umbrella. But more importantly, we productized the 14 years of sales development expertise into our prospect relationship management platform. Mm -hmm. The whole thing's based on accountability. Um, we know all the tricks that somebody's going to use to not do the job the right way daily. So we've built a system that ensures that your sales development team is going to be doing it the right way every day. And the system serves up information to you in the areas where they're not doing it the right way so that you can actually, uh, which is probably near and dear to your heart, you can coach with some context. Right. You know, you know what to talk about. So that's where we are now. We're, we're excited. We just really started selling the platform probably two months ago aggressively. Mm -hmm. um, we've got what we call the Sales Development Hub, which is a series of partnerships um, that bring a lot of additional value uh, to our client relationships. So Such we're as? Excited. So what's what? Um, well, we've baked, I don't know if you're familiar with a company called Ambition. Um, they're a gamification and analytics okay. organization. Uh, we, we started talking to them and became so enamored with how good they are at what they do. We actually just gave them a tab in the, in the product. So that's an example of some really high-powered analytics and reporting, but also some, some top-of-the-line gamification that we, we give our clients access right through the system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Inside View has been a great partner right. on the front end um, where their entire data stack or technology stack is, is integrated uh, and included in our user licenses. Mm -hmm. um, company called Campaign Stars, it's a startup uh, out of uh, San Francisco. Uh, Henry's the CEO there. Uh, they really help out in uh, generating outbound campaigns uh, and, and creating and repurposing content. Uh, for our clients to drive inbound traffic into the Quota Factory platform for uh, prospecting purposes. Those are just a couple. Um, HG Data, another California-based company, uh, we give our all of our clients access to their uh, technology install data. So when you're prospecting, you actually know what the technology landscape looks like within that organization mm -hmm. as you're doing your, your prospecting. So, so they're, make, they're like a, a data nice or something like that? Yes. Yep. Very similar. Okay. Well, I mean, all right. So I'm gonna let's we're gonna get back to that because I think that's really important. We'll talk more in depth about about your platform. But to start is is you had several interesting things you said. So you said you have focus on quality in sales development, and this seems to me really sort of problematic for most companies that are really embracing the the sales development model these days. Is that is that there seems to be this real focus on quantity over quality. And we see it repeated in spite of, you know, excuse me, a lot of people, um, you know, writing pretty extensively and teaching about, you know, best practices for, you know, personalization, and engagement, and rapport building, and so on, is when you're a recipient of the messaging, which I am, I sign up for a mailing list just for the purposes of, of, of yeah. hearing, seeing what people do, as I'm sure you probably do as well, is, is, you know, we don't seem to have made any progress in that regard by and large, with most companies, you know, ever. Yeah. I, I think there's two fundamental issues with, uh, with the sales development function. Um, and a lot of them stem from the fact that there's tens of millions of dollars or venture dollars, uh, marketing dollars, being pumped into propping it up as, you know, the, the savior for every organization, which is wonderful for us to a degree, but it, there's also an inherent danger in that because what's happening is there's a generation of people that are lacking the real fundamental conversational skills and training that are required in order to be successful in sales development. Um, that's, that's an issue. What's causing that issue is the, is the second issue, that most of the technology that's being built and deployed around sales development from a prospecting tool standpoint, incentivizes more and more and more emails going out to the prospects. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, an under, I call a flood of undifferentiated messaging. Yes, you know, um, my LinkedIn inbox is one of the worst. I I don't go there anymore. It's just a cesspool of of terrible prospecting emails, right? So yes, uh, I, I look at it as a real issue in that marketing automation is mature. Marketo is mature. Eloqua is mature. They are doing a good job at what they're supposed to do. And people now know how to use their marketing automation systems. Mm -hmm. So that prospect universe is getting hammered already by your marketing function. (laughs) Yes. With with brand-related, brand-building-related information. You then give that same contact information to a sales development rep who's being forced to deploy technology that teaches them how to send more emails. So I'm getting your Marketo emails, and now I'm getting emails from your SDR in a capacity. And nowhere in in a large capacity. And nowhere in the process is that SDR being required to pick up the phone and follow up on that email or those emails. So what I'm seeing, and I do sign up for all these things, Andy. It's terrifying in my my inbox. Yours is probably the same way. Mm -hmm. But there are people prospecting me right now that have never called my phone number. No, most of them. And, and I know that they've got a cadence built and it's being sent out and they don't even know in most cases that they're communicating with me. So fundamentally, when we talk about quality, it is impossible to say that you are producing a quality opportunity if you've not put a premium on an actual live exchange with that individual. So I, I hope that answers your question, but that's my, my, my take on what's going on now and the biggest issue that's out there. Yeah, because I, I, just to follow up on you said, it, it seems to me that sales development is, is with, in conjunction with automation, is being used to serve a sledgehammer approach to sales. Right? Yeah. Where what we're going to do, is, and sort of, you know, you talked about how in your website and your materials, you talk about sales development being both an art and a science. Yeah, to me, it seems like the art's being lost because, as I said, we've got this brute force approach that is really being encouraged in most companies. And it's more about probabilities than art. Exactly. You know, if, I, it, if I do enough of this, something's going to happen. And even though my close rates at the end of the day are, are minuscule compared to what they should be, I'm still going to hit some sort of number just because you know, the volume on the other end is so big. Yeah. It, companies are mathing themselves right out of business. It seems like it, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. I, 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 I've asked people that question, and, and people have been on the show. I've asked many guests. It's, it's, uh, aren't we in danger of sort of blowing the sales model to the smithereens through the way we're using it. Yeah, but the silver lining is be one of those companies to deploy a conversation-focused strategy. And you immediate, it's so strange to me. You know, It used to be I get 100 calls a day. Nobody says that anymore. They say I get 1,000 emails a week. That's true. So by picking up the phone or by, in our case, by deploying our product, which is phone-focused, you're, you're actually, I can't believe I'm saying it, but you're differentiating yourself by using the phone in the sales process. Well, this is a sort of curious, too, when you think about it, because, you know, there's no shortage of, of books that have come out recently. There's, in fact, in the last six months, two years, there's been a slew of books coming out about proactive prospecting that, yep. you know, some portion of them you know, talk pretty significantly about picking up the phone and making calls. Yeah. But you're saying it, it doesn't seem to be happening. Is that because you can't, uh, sales managers are making the calculation that they can't make the number of contacts that they need to make uh, if they're doing on the phone versus just, you know, hey, I can track the emails and I can track the engagement and all that? It's, th- those are kind of symptoms of the greater problem. I think it's generational. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to get into some, you know, I love millennials. That's my whole staff are millennials. I have no problem with them. I actually enjoy having a company full of, of millennials. It's not about that. What I mean is, Generally, generationally, you now have a uh, subset of the corporate population that is a quote-unquote sales development manager. And they were brought up through the ranks being trained on practices that didn't involve the phone. And for them, when they were, when they were doing the job, the phone wasn't a priority, but the, the science was new so that prospects were responding at a higher rate. But as those rate, those response rates started to decrease because of the onslaught of the amount of email activity going towards prospects, those people never adjusted their take on how the job needs to be done to compensate for that. 
So they don't know how to do the job with a phone-focused approach or a conversation-focused approach. And now they're training another generation of SDRs to do it the same way. So until, until we crack the code of getting the message out to those people that they've got to change and differentiate through phone, it's, you're just going to keep seeing this kind of kicking the can down the road with, with massive, amounts of, um, massive amounts of emails being thrown at prospects. Yeah, because you can make a very good argument that you can't build an authentic relationship and a rapport with a prospect without talking to them. Exactly. <laughs> and increasingly, as I talk about it, I mean, how you sell is more important than really those than what you're selling is you, you know, how you sell involves a conversation. You can't get it done without it. You can't get it done without it. You know, and I mean, I'm psyched for, you know, selfishly because we, we love the phone. We love conversation. So our, our business is poised for, for rapid, large growth over the next couple of years because we've stuck to our guns. Um, I love email automation. I love the tools that are out there, but how you deploy them um, and if they are part of a conversation-focused strategy or a dialing-focused strategy, that's great. But when you get all caught up in, oh, Andy opened my emails 72 times, you know, well, maybe your maybe your cat crawled over the keyboard on the computer and and <laughs> you know opened the email a bunch of times. Right. It doesn't. What does that really tell you? Oh, yeah, not much, right? Not as much as you think. I mean, it's different if you've had one or two great conversations with the prospect. You send them an email that maybe has a, a proposal in it, and you can say, "Oh, yeah, they opened the proposal, and hey, they've opened it four or five times in the last two days." Well, that's pretty significant. Yeah, or they forwarded it. Or they forwarded it, right? Yeah. But in the absence of that conversation as a, a precedent, yeah, there's not much meaning in it. Agreed. So, all right, well, we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back. We're going to follow up on this because uh, I want to talk about, about uh, sales productivity because I think this is, this is an issue. Even with a, a conversation-focused approach, uh, understanding that seems to be a challenge for a lot of sales managers. So back with my guest, Peter Gracie, right after the break. Hi, this is Andy. Connect and Sell is used by sales reps at nearly a 1,000 companies, including hundreds of technology startups and several Fortune 500 companies, to overcome the challenges of getting prospects on the phone. Companies using Connect and Sell grow their revenues faster by enabling their sales reps to have more sales conversations in 90 minutes than they could otherwise achieve in an entire week. Connect and Sell can be deployed directly to your sales reps, or you can take advantage of their outbound on-demand service, which delivers qualified prospect meetings scheduled directly on your sales reps' calendars. Visit connectandsell.com to learn more about how Connect and Sell can start filling your pipeline today. Okay, I'm back with my guest, Pete Gracie. Uh, we we're talking about sales development, art, science, brute force approach, how it has to be conversation-focused, as opposed to just relying on email automation to... Uh, spam your your potential prospects so how do, how do you measure sales productivity it seems to be a real challenge in the sales development environment because it, it's always about more 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 and let's say we really not about the quality so i mean how do you how do you measure what's real productivity well, is you can so we there's one final metric that that tells you whether or not um you're getting the job done. And that's obviously your, your, the number of opportunities you generate and the rate at which those convert. So we can assume that those are the most, two most important um, ways to look at whether or not your sales development function is, is working. So am I getting enough opportunity? And am I qualifying them significantly enough so that they're converting for my salespeople because the calls are going well? So we agree that those are the two most important things. But then you get into to how you're ma managing or measuring SDR productivity on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Mm -hmm. And where a lot of people get caught up is that they take a very reactive approach to measuring their reps. Meaning, hey, you, you didn't hit your call number today. Or you didn't have the right amount of quality conversations today mm -hmm. in relationship to your call number. Um, that's fine. You need to talk about that kind of stuff. But what no one ever explains to SDRs in their onboarding is why the metrics matter. So we, we track number of dials, number of quality conversations from those dials, number of opportunities passed. And then we also require our reps to manage their own databases to a degree. Mm -hmm. So we actually track net new accounts added and net new contacts added. 
And every day they've got to hit certain goals in each one of those categories. And our system is visually prompting them to hit those goals to try to get the nice green check mark at the end of the day. But if you don't sit down with an SDR on day two after they've had their HR and product day, right, Mm -hmm. and and say, all right, this is how we're going to measure you. And here is what it means to you if you overachieve against these measurements over the course of a quarter, over the course of a year. Nobody does that. So the, the, the metrics part is easy. Just look at their activity. Calls, conversations, conversions, leads passed, uh, whatever you want, however you want to slice and dice it, that part's easy. But what seems to be hard for people is actually helping the SDR understand what the numbers mean and why they should hit them. Well, you're really talking about sort of good basic sales management 101 is, is, yeah, how do you motivate and keep people engaged unless you relate their objectives in terms of what they're trying to achieve in their own lives? Right. And it's a great, it's a great way to, to gauge talent and work ethic. If I'm very, if I'm very adept, Andy, you, you know, you started as, as a, you started as, as an SDR for us tomorrow and I'm very adept at making sure you understand that in what these numbers mean and how they're going to benefit you and why they're impactful for the company. And we shake hands and say, all right, I got it. You give me your commitment that you understand it. I ask you a couple questions to make sure it's sunk in. And then the next day you don't do any of it. What would I infer about you as an employee? Maybe you didn't get it. I'll meet with you again and go through it again. And then the next day you don't do it. I probably have the wrong type of person in the position. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because what you're in, in fact saying to me is that, yeah, you explained it to me. I get it. That's the way we grow the business and I succeed professionally. But I don't care enough about that in order to actually do it. Mm-hmm. So we use it as, as a talent evaluation point. So, uh, interesting question then. So, what do you do to, and without getting too digressed too far, is what do you do then during that interview process to try to assess whether that, that post onboarding conversation is going to be a good conversation? Well, the first thing I try to find out legally, I never just ask it straight out, is whether or not mom and dad had sales experience. Whether or not mom or dad had sales experience. Yes. Direct, well, that's, that's, co- direct that's, correlation to par- a parent that was a salesperson. And success in the SDR function. That is I, interesting. So you're finding you're finding that correl- you're finding that correlation. Yes, a direct correlation. Ten times out of ten, uh, we see it. You know, really. If, if mom had had a very successful career in sales, was a VP, um, chances are that that individual saw the fruits of that labor and was um, given an indoctrination and uh, an education as to how hard work and sales can lead to a great life. Uh, and they get it. They understand that the, the end result is great when you embark on a career in sales. Whereas kids that are coming out of school, students that are coming out of school that we're hiring, if their parents aren't, you know, they don't have sales DNA, it doesn't mean they're not going to be good at it, but they tend to ramp a little slower. Because they, you have to go through that education as to why sales is valuable. How, you know, yeah, you took this job because it was available to you and it seems like a cool company, but you don't envision yourself being a salesperson. You have to take them through that process of helping them understand why. You know what? You might want to consider being a salesperson. It's a pretty damn good career. Mm-hmm. And you know that that's the first thing we try to find out. But you know, you can't. At least I've been told I can't go in and say, do either one of your parents sell? <laughs> okay, they don't. Get out. Get uh, out. You're out of here. You know, so that's the first thing I, I like to find. But then we don't hire based on skills. We hire very raw talent. Mm-hmm. But we, we evaluate them based on work ethic, intelligence, and character. So work ethic is straightforward. You just want people that are going to get after it on a daily basis. So our questioning is all designed around ascertaining what we think their work ethic is going to be like. Um, intelligence, we go to GPA, we go to conversation skills. Uh, we, we try to get a gauge on how smart is this person because the more intelligent they're going to be, um, the more able they are going to be at understanding, understanding abstract technologies and concepts and translating those into English <laughs> that, that works in the sales process. And, do you, and then, find, do you find GPA a reliable indicator as well? Yeah, we do. We do. So if they're coming out of a decent B school, you know, 3.7, 3.8, those are usually 
people that are accustomed to overachievement mm-hmm. uh, like to be measured and rewarded for that mm-hmm. measurement. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a great indicator of somebody that's going to respond positively to a comp plan. And then the the character piece. That's we're we're a culture focused company. It's, you know, it's it's what we're all about. We you know when my business partner and I started the organization, we knew we were going to miss time with our families, and we made a commitment that if if we're going to sacrifice that time, um, it had better be spent uh, surrounded by people that we love working with. So there's a there's a general camaraderie that you want to see your team have and kindness. Uh, towards one another, friendly competition as opposed to, you know, cutthroat type competition. So um, th- those are the three areas that we we craft our, our interview questions around. Okay. Love it. No, I just, I, I know we digressed a little bit, but I'm fascinated on the mom and dad and sales. Uh, that's, that's the first time I heard that. And that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. I think about that. Now, ironically, neither one of my parents were in sales. Oh, mine neither. Yeah. So. Yeah. No one in my family except for me. That's why I can't close a door. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I don't think I'd be a very good SDR, but that's that's besides the point. I mean, yeah. I I spent back when I started sales, it was all door to door. We got out and went out face to face. That that I could still do. I'm not sure about the phone thing, but anyway. Yeah. Um. So let's talk a little bit about Quota Factory and and your system. So how how are you different than the other sales development? You've talked about being conversation focused, but you know, practical sense, how's that manifest itself in terms of how you're differentiated from other sales development platforms? Yeah. So th- so there. The way to think about RPRM is, you know, the, the operative word is accountability. Whereas we, we've built a system that is designed to function as your assistant sales development manager. Meaning, rather than focus on creating things that were very, and, and it's a beautiful product, so don't get me wrong, but we weren't worried about how it looks. Mm-hmm. We were worried about how it functioned, mm-hmm. the development process. So we wanted, to under, we wanted to make sure we built something that took the 14 years of seeing every move an SDR could possibly make to not do the job the right way and game the system so that it never allowed them to do that. So when you, t- when you walk through the Quota Factory product, you begin to see it like, okay, I get it. This thing is going to make sure that they, they stick to that activity number. So give me an example of how that might work. So on the homepage, it's visually there, there's five dials on there. They've got their to- they've got three around activities, and they've got two around database management. And at the start of the day, there's a big zero percentage in the middle of each one of those those gauges. Mm-hmm. And as they progress through their day and execute on the predetermined call plan that the system makes them execute on, right back to the accountability, they start to see the 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 gauge fill in. And the colors go from angry red to beautiful purple. And then finally, at the end of the day, when you hit your total activity number, it's all green with a big, pretty green check mark in the middle. So I, I, I just digress to preschool talk right there, but um, <laughs> you get my point. It's sure. visually prompting them. Every time they get back to their homepage, they feel their own progress. And then the manager is getting a roll-up page that has all five of those gauges for each one of his reps or mm-hmm. her reps mm-hmm. so that they can go out and, as I mentioned before, coach with context. If it's 2.30 in the afternoon and you're at 10% of your total dials number, I'm going to go have a three-minute conversation with you, take a look at your database, help you, help you put um, 15 new contacts into a, into a power dialing session and get you on your way to getting to that activity number. Right. Conversely, if it's 5 o'clock or 4.30 and you've got none of your database work done, what does that mean for tomorrow? You're not going to have anyone to call. So I'm going to go out, coach with context, help you find more uh, meaningful prospects to call and get them in the queue for, for the next day. Right. And that, so that same level of accountability is, is unique to what you're doing? It is. It is. You know, it, it's, it's more about the substance than the sizzle. Mm-hmm. Um, and and additionally, you know, we're the only platform that's built with the idea of having more phone calls, so it's designed as such. But we also we have data included in the system. We have all of the call planning functionality uh, that you need and the management functionality that you need. Need, and we've also got the best in class telephony on the back end. So you're getting unlimited power dialing. You're getting unlimited call recording. 
You're getting local phone numbers if you so choose to deploy those. That is an additional cost. But we're the only place where you can go, pay a reasonable fee, and eliminate eight different tools with one login to Quota Factory. Right, because of your, you'll, you'll, you'll like of your agreements with all the other... Right, right. And you'll like this, Andy. When we, when, we were trying to do our, when we were doing our due diligence about whether or not to go down this path, we surveyed everyone we'd worked with. So we got about, I don't know, we got a lot of responses. And the average number of tools that an SDR is being forced to use is eight. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And most companies don't deploy single sign-on. So that's eight different logins, eight different usernames. Like, I can't remember my ATM PIN number. I can't imagine logging into eight different things to try to get my job done a day. And what does that create? Lack of focus on the actual part of the job that matters, which is talking to prospects live. Right, right. Yeah, you end yeah. up you end up doing a lot of things that that uh, may seem urgent but aren't really important. Yeah, and young young SDRs gravitate towards things that are more fun, like research. Yeah. You know, because picking up the phone leads to rejection in most cases. So if you're given an opportunity or a window by your company to do other things that don't involve opening yourself up for that rejection, most likely you're going to gravitate towards that. Yeah, it's so interesting. You think about the behavior of, of sales in general, right? I mean, it's it's not just SDRs. It goes, goes on forever. Is people willingly come into these jobs knowing that the jobs are all about proactively going out and reaching out to people and talking to them. And yet we spend hours, days, weeks, months, books are being written about why people, once they get in those jobs, then don't want to make the calls. <laughs> right. And I've always found that. Really, I'd like to see that approach from really sort of a psychological standpoint. Is how does that happen? You know, are people willingly enter this profession knowing that and go through an interview process knowing that it has a certain requirement? And then when they get in it, it's almost like I want to do everything but that. I, I mean, I can't quantify it. I haven't, I haven't researched it. But I, I do believe it's that onboarding issue that we discussed a couple minutes ago. Yeah. That, you know, in order for me to engage in a behavior that you want me to engage in, it's in your best interest to make me really understand why that behavior is going to benefit me. Well, and I think also for companies is, is to follow up on that is companies really use, need to use the onboarding process as like the final step of the interview. I mean, somebody yeah. may have come on, but you're, you're still evaluating whether they're suitable. And you know, if you're in the onboarding phase and it becomes clear, as you talk about, that someone just isn't up for it, then that's the time to help them find some other thing to do. Because rather than invest another six months in them, thinking you can turn them around. Oh, yeah. And, and we've suffered from it internally, too. P- people are afraid to fire. You know, it, they view it as a personal failure when somebody doesn't succeed in a job in your organization. But sometimes you place someone in a position that they are not designed to succeed at. No, you're and, not. Yeah, and you're not doing yourself any of you favors yeah, by. You have to have rules around the point at which you, you cut bait. Right. Okay, well, great. Well, we're going to give you a chance in a second to tell people where to find out more about Quota Factory. I want to move to the last segment of my show. I've got some standard questions I ask all my guests. All right. The first one is a hypothetical scenario. You may be prepared for this since you said you've listened to some episodes. And so in the scenario, you've just been hired as a new sales leader at a company whose sales have stalled out. They want things turned around. The company wants things turned around in a hurry. So what, what two things would you do your first week on the job that could have the biggest impact? My first week on the job, what would have the biggest impact? So I think the, the first order of business for me, and it's, it's not because it's my passion and what we've been doing, but I'd, get, I'd do a sales development assessment. Mm-hmm. So what is, you know, I need, I need to understand what team is in place, what's the output they're currently delivering, um, what's the ratio of SDRs to salespeople, um, and and deploy some best practices around fixing that because most likely if sales were were flagging, uh, that's going to be a, a point of issue. Mm-hmm. The second thing I would do is take the VP of marketing or CMO out for a beer and make some friends um, and make sure that that individual understood that in order for the company to be successful, uh, we we've got to become a team. And make sure that individual understands the level of appreciation that I have for that function and how when it's done properly, it can, it can drive so much success in sales. Um, I think what you see, unfortunately, in, in most cases is that new sales leader comes in and does just the opposite. 
with their marketing counterpart. Right. Um, and that's just a, it's a recipe for disaster. So yep. those would be the two things I'd do first. Okay, perfect. Like it. So some rapid fire questions for you then. You can give me one word answers if you wish. And the first one is when you, Pete Gracie, are out selling, what's your most powerful sales attribute? Uh, I think, I think I, I'm very personal in the sales process. Personable. I think, you know, I, I want, sorry, I know it's one word, but when, no, you work, you can... when you work with the people that I have on my team, so if you become a customer, you're genuinely going to like working with the people you encounter. Mm-hmm. And, it, and I need to portray that in the sales process. So I think likability um, and establishing a comfort level and rapport are my biggest strengths. Who's your sales role model? Jeez. Sales role model. It would probably be my uh, my former boss, Ellen. Even though she wasn't a, a salesperson, the, the the way that she managed people mm-hmm. and extracted the most value uh, out of out of individuals was something that I that I always um, appreciated. And then my my GM from the the hotel I worked at, Tom Smalley, um, he could close anybody. So he he taught me the art of of getting to yes. So he he was a role model for me as well. Okay. What's one book every salesperson should read? Uh, the Sales Development Playbook is excellent. Trish Bertuzzi, okay. Yep, Trish's book. Uh, I just, I mean, I finished it a while ago, but uh, I like books where you get practical advice, mm-hmm. you know, and, and stuff that, you, that causes you to think and then makes you deploy it. So that, that one had that effect on me. Okay, excellent. So last question for you, what, what's on your playlist these days? What are you listening to? Oh man, so my, I, this is going to sound ridiculous, but I, I, I've been listening to a lot of Tribe Called Quest, mm-hmm. uh, and I have a 16-month-old, so we drive around a lot. So I've been listening to like a lot of Barney <laughs> and some well, Raffy. Raffy, of course. Yep, yep. Um, it's pretty mind-numbing. I actually don't mind the kids' music, uh, but I, I hate to break it to you, but that's pretty. Uh, I'm normally a, a kind of 90s alternative guy yeah Pearl jam nirvana all that right. all that good stuff but right now it's mostly barney and raffi and raffi yeah i when my kids were growing up i long after they had, had gone through that phase like they were in elementary school and middle school and so on i'd, I'd catch myself still singing raffi songs <laughs> to myself yeah <laughs> baby beluga it's a great song yeah it wasn't baby beluga it's like eight piggies in a row i think <laughs> so I still sing it occasionally. That, that tune just can't get out of my head. So anyway. Good memories. <laughs> great memories. So Pete, tell people how they can find out more about, uh, about you. Sure. They can, uh, they can go to quotafactory.com, Q-U-O-T-A factory.com. Um, we've got uh, a great, great team that assembles our website uh, content. You know, I, I would go to the resources page in the blog. I mm-hmm. think you'll get a feel for uh, the, con- the content that we produce is, is – Again, we, we like it to be practical and usable, um, and we try to cross the, the entire spectrum of things that an SDR might be able to uh, digest and, and use all the way up to CMO, VP sales level individuals, uh, more strategic documentation. So you get a good feel for what we're all about as a company by digesting some of our, our content on the site. Well, great. Well, again, thanks for being on the show. And Mark, Andy. Yeah, and remember, friends, make it a part of your day every day to deliberately learn something new to help you accelerate your success. And one easy way to do that is to make this podcast accelerate a part of your daily routine, whether you're listening on your commute, in the gym, or as part of your morning sales meeting. This way, you won't miss any of my conversations with top business experts like my guest today, Pete Gracie, who shared his expertise about how to accelerate the growth of your business. So thanks for joining me. Until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guests, visit my website at andypaul.com. 